Good morning, church. I'm Gonzo, one of the ministers of uh, here, of discipleship and mission. And it's always great to hear so many amazing things going on at our church. As you know, we started a new series uh, last week of questions that you submitted. So we're going to dive into the scripture for today's uh, message. It is in Luke 23, verse 32 to 43, and it says, Two other men, both criminals, were also led out with him to be executed. When they came to the place called the Skull, they crucified him there, along with the criminals. On one his right, and the other one on his left. Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they're doing. And they divided up his clothes by casting lots. The people stood watching, and the rulers even sneered at him. They said, he saved others, let him save himself, if he is God's Messiah, the chosen one. The soldiers also came up and mocked him. They offered him wine vinegar and said, if you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. There was a written notice about him, which read, this is the king of the Jews. One of the criminals who hung there hurled insults at him. Aren't you the Messiah? Save yourself and ask. But the other criminal rebuked him. Don't you fear God, he said, since you are under the same sentence? We are punished justly, for we are getting what our deeds deserve. But this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come in your kingdom. And Jesus answered him, Truly I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. This passage is one that we have read many times. And a lot of times we do it during Easter. But I don't think it's a bad time to read this such a special passage because it's so powerful. Look here is retelling an important aspect of God's crucifixion. As he focuses on these two thieves. One representing humanity. One representing all of us that have done bad things. That didn't welcome Jesus. But actually did the opposite. Rejected him to the point of death. But the other one, although as guilty as the first one, recognizing that he deserved that. But Jesus didn't. And it wasn't about what he did or the way he said the things he said. But Jesus saw his heart and gave him the opportunity to be with him in paradise. As human beings, we're eternal beings because God put in us eternal life. And today as we hear the message of God, let's focus on that, what God has for us. And let's respond accordingly. I want to invite Lily to keep reading the next scripture. Good morning. Today's scripture comes from 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 13 through 18. Brothers and sisters, we do not want you to be uninformed about those who sleep in death, so that you do not grieve like the rest of mankind, who have no hope. For we believe that Jesus died and rose again, and so we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in him. According to the Lord's word, we tell you that we who are still alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will certainly not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet call of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first. After that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will be with the Lord forever. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. Will you please bow your heads and pray with me? Dear God, help us to prepare our hearts to really hear Pastor Mike's message for us this morning. I pray everyone leaves this room with a new thought on their mind and a new message on their heart. Help us to understand that we are all here right now for a reason. You have something special to share with us, and we know that you are using Pastor Mike to give us this message. Amen.
Well, good morning. I know that others before me have said that, so I'll, I'll address those of you that are worshiping with us online. Good whenever you're grabbing us. We hope you're here live, but if not, good afternoon, good evening. Uh, welcome to Marion Methodist. Uh, a couple of uh, celebrations as I get going. First, um, I, not a celebration in the fact that they're done, but our summer ministry intern, Caden Walker, who preached last week, concludes his term with us tomorrow. And our summer uh, fly interns, uh, Aaron Davenport and Noah Beardser, finish their term at the end of this week when we feed uh, Friday our last day of fly. So I'd love it if you guys would give them a great hand. They have wonderful, <laughs> wonderful summer. They did a great job. Now, a celebration today. Um, all of you guys that are here uh, that are part of Marion Methodist that were part of the Holy Heat, come on up here, our softball team. We need you up here in the front. Come on. Don't sit still. I know who you are. I'll call you out by name if you want me to. Come on, Jared. Come on, Gonzo. Where are you at? They're all hiding. Well, there's a lot more of them. You can see their picture. These guys are the Parks and Recs City Champion. There you go. Here. Jesse, you, here comes Gonzo. You can see the guys. So they have this priceless trophy now that we can parade around but not make it an icon. They wanted me to put it on the altar, but no. Give them a hand. Yay. Good job, guys. Good job. All right. I'll put it up here like you wanted. No. You can gaze on it, and if somebody wants a picture with it afterwards, our official photographers have left, but you can have your own. It's not really gold. <laughs> um, I, I want to use just one other moment of preparatory time to talk about the week of prayer that Vicki announced to you, specifically two events. Uh, do come back tonight. I noticed this morning when I looked uh, on my phone, a couple of our middle schools and one of the other schools didn't have anyone signed up for it. Um, like Vicki said, if you can't sign up online, you can go through the church app or through the website or simply come here and say, I'll pray. We need to pray for our teachers. We need to pray for our students. We need to pray for our administrators. And we need to pray for parents too. So uh, come on back uh, this, this night at six o'clock. And men, just men, um, tomorrow morning at 6.30, we're gonna have a gathering. Um, I believe that men should be the warriors of the church on, prayer in, on their knees. Um, this is for all guys. Um, it's gonna start at 6.30. We'll be done about 7.15. So if you gotta zip out to work or somewhere else, come on in the church. We'll direct you to where we're going. Um, uh, I know we'll have a, a few handfuls of you. I'd love to have uh, a lot more. So come on back. Um, I promise you uh, we won't be for here for hours and hours. Um, all right, let's get right to the talk. So Caden launched crowdsourcing last week. So our crowdsourcing question for today is a simple one. When someone dies, what happens to their spirit? Ben Franklin said years ago, in this world, nothing can be said to be certain except death and taxes. And we're both certain of both. And the reason that this question has come up is it appears that most every human being has asked, what happens when I die? What happens to me when I, was, when I die? And I will tell you, because this is one of the truths of my life, and it was formative in my faith, is that when I, I, I call myself Little Mike, when I was like in a grade school kid, um, I was terrified of the whole idea of mortality. You know, the older we get, a little bit more familiar we become with it. But when you're a little child, um, I would be so afraid of the fact that, well, first, what happens when you die? The cosmos is so big. There's really a bunch of unknowns. And why would the world want to live on without me, right? But I would be terrified. And sometimes I'd just wake up in night terrors and be running around and sometimes run into my mom or dad's room and they would comfort me and care for me. But it really wasn't until I started getting my mind around the fact uh, that there is a peacefulness, a joy, a glory, and a home that awaits me in, in heaven to, to where I could be comfortable with the fact that something's going to happen to me when I die. And, and we know that there's a universality of this concern. We're not so certain about it our, ourselves. And because almost every human being wants to know what happens when I die, pretty much every discipline in academia and in the scientific world, has engaged the question. So, so I'm going to give you a quick walkthrough of science, medicine, philosophy, who have all come to differing and conflicting conclusions. So I'll start with science. Um, uh, Stephen Hawking 
believes that our human life, when it comes to its conclusion, that we are like a computer that just shuts off and once the fan stops whirring, that's it, we're over. Now, on the other hand, another physicist, a fellow named Max Planck, a Nobel Prize winner, so not just a physicist, a guy, he says that physics shows that consciousness is not a product of physical matter, such as brain cells, since it exists outside physical matter. He says it's almost certain that consciousness outlasts physical death. So science is in a little bit of conflict. Now, thermodynamics says that energy and matter cannot be created or destroyed, which means life cannot end at death. So that's science. Let's look at medicine. Now, many physicians are of the matter, and I, I read quite a number of uh, research people pa pages on this and, uh, this week. Uh, quite a lot of physicians believe that, that when your body ends, that's what there is. That's it. Now, many other physicians, because they've experienced and had patients that have count encountered one as long as 22 minutes of physical death and then come back and told of their experiences, Many physicians says, no, there is something uh, after our life that has to do with our consciousness, our spirit moving on. I, I recall in, in when my last parish, I had a fellow that was declared dead in an operating room for eight minutes. And then he fooled the doctors and came back. And Bob told the story, and he told it in our pulpit one day, about how he literally knew when he had stopped being physically alive because he kind of saw himself from outside of himself in the operating room. And he could see the doctors panicking, but the next thing he saw was the most beautiful spectrum of light, and he saw all of his parents and grandparents there, and he was walking towards them, and when he got close, his mother said, Bob, go back. It's not time for you. It's not time for you to come. And I woke up in Webster City which is not heaven. <laughs> so physicians themselves are, are split on this matter. So what about philosophy? Well, the great atheists like, like Marx and, and Lenin and, and Nietzsche say that the afterlife is in conflict with living the fullest life you can live here on earth. On the other hand, some of the ancients, Socrates, Plato, more recently, or at least in the last couple hundred years, Immanuel Kant says the soul must live on beyond the body. So, so kind of you look at academia and, and they're con con conflicting and not making the same decision on this same matter. So I looked into our American culture and a number of, of things by Gallup and Pew Research to say, where are Americans on this in the generation in which you're living, in which I'm living? 75% of Americans living today, North Americans, uh, believe in the afterlife. It's undefined. They're not willing to say it's heaven necessarily, but they believe that there is some life for, for what we call the mind, the consciousness, or the spirit after we die. Forty percent of those who believe in the afterlife say that belief in God is not necessary to go to heaven. So our culture, like most of humanity in every generation up through today, crave our lives to extend past our physical death. Now my role as the pastor, as one that's been set aside uh, to teach and preach the gospel and, and, and expound upon the word of God, it is to, to share and interpret the word of God on this issue for you this morning. So biblical Christianity teaches that God has set, the etern set eternity in the hearts of human beings. It's not humans' ideas that there's an eternity to be a part of. God has planted that idea in us. Look what it says in Ecclesiastes 3. He, God, has made everything beautiful in its time. He has also set eternity in the human heart. Yet, and this is an important yet, yet no one can fathom what God has done from beginning to the end. Now, there are many passages, and I'm happy to sit and, and rehearse some of those with you if you want to take the time at a later moment, but there are many passages in the Bible that make it clear that we do not cease to exist in the moment that our bodies play out. We do not. 
And so we're going to kind of dip our toes, such as it was, into the spiritual pond of the truth that is the Holy Scriptures. In the Old Testament, the prophet Daniel says these words, Many of those whose bodies lie dead and buried will rise up, some to eternal li or everlasting life, and some to shame and everlasting disgrace. I, I want you to see the binary terms that are put out by the prophet. There, there are choices available here. The categories, however, are binary. It is either, either everlasting life or to shame and everlasting disgrace. Now, the prophets are always important. The apostles are always important. But of course, the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, Jesus himself, has something to say on this matter as well. And Jesus said, I tell you the truth, those who listen to my message and believe in God who sent me have eternal life. Pretty clear. They will never be condemned for their sins, but they have already passed from death into life. Biblical Christianity then teaches when people die, their soul continues to live. Understand that. Biblical Christianity teaches when people die, their souls continue to live. This is one of the core Christian doctrines. Followers of, believe, of Jesus believe there is an afterlife, and Christ is the key to what will happen when you die. It, it always goes back to Jesus because Jesus lived a perfect life and died on behalf of all people so their wrongdoings and rebellions can be forgiven. That perfect life is what it took for your wrongdoings, your rebellions, same for me, to be forgiven. There is this need for us to give honest and faithful con confession. When we honestly and faithfully confess our sins, our sins, our, our condemnation is replaced. When we accept Jesus as our only way to God, we can be blessed with the righteousness of Christ and spend eternity with him. So it's easy to say, hard to do, but this is the truth. Listen to Jesus. Believe that he is God's son. Come down from heaven to show us the way, the truth, and the one path to heaven and receive him as your savior for the forgiveness of sins. Only a perfect God can make imperfect people again. Only a perfect God can take the sins that have so stained our beautiful, created, sinless souls and restore it and redeem us to our original value, which is made in the image of him. Only God can do that. Now, there when we got these questions from you, and I appreciate that there were more than five, which was, you know, the number of weeks that we allotted for this, um, there were a couple of sub-questions because there were some questions that bunched themselves together. So I don't want to, to betray you. I want to handle a couple of these uh, sub-questions. So there were two crowdsourcing sub-questions that came with this particular topic. Number one, if we do not know if someone accepted Jesus, but they believed in a higher power and obeyed the commandments, will they be in heaven? That's a question a lot of us have about people that we know that really maybe have never expressed, oh, I'm saved, or maybe even never, you know, worshiped with the, with the community of faith or that sort of thing. Please listen to what I'm saying, not to what I'm saying, because I think it's important to remember. God knows the human heart. You know, I know about some of you, but really within us, there's always three personalities residing. There's the person that we let all of you see. There's the person that we want to be. And there's the personality that we really are. And that's the, that's the human heart that God knows. He doesn't care about the facades we put on. He doesn't even really care at some degree to our intentions. What he cares about is who we really are. So, so God knows the human heart of, of anyone that you know that you love even still today or who's passed on before us we need to know that, remind ourselves that God knows the human heart and we need to allow God to do God's work because he's very good at it. And he's been doing it for such a long time. 
So, so don't let ourselves get into the, be, the, the business of judging people or of trying to decide who goes to heaven and who does not. I know it's indigenous to the human uh, condition. I know it's one of our greatest faults, but it's not our job description. It's God's responsibility. So don't spend your life seeking to unravel what you cannot know at the moment right now. Rather, make your decision, because that's the one you control. Make your decision clear, and soon, and very soon, you will know the answer to this question. The second sub-question that I feel responsible to, to share with you and, and address, does prevenient grace pave the way for them, which, which links back to the first question. So prevenient grace, if you, if you haven't really drank this in uh, over the years, prevenient grace is the grace of God that's just pouring towards us, even before we know that maybe there is a God, or even before we know that we need some sort of salvation, even before we need, know that we might need to repent. It's always God, in a winsome way, beckoning to us to come to him to, to offer him to offer us his grace his love his salvation it's always Christ and, and coming towards us but the question is does prevenient grace pave the way for them well it paves the way for all of us so the answer is yes and of course and a paved road must be trod upon a road is not there just simply to gaze upon it's meant to be moved along. So of course the responsibility that we have is to walk on that road to believe and receive Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. So I return now to the original, the specific question of the day. When someone dies, what happens to their spirit? And the scripture offers a very binary answer throughout. There, there's not a lot of wiggle room on this. i sorry, I said that wrong. There's no wiggle room on this particular matter. Either you're separated from God, which means the complete absence of God. Now, the visuals are unclear. There are a few in the scriptures, visuals about, uh, about those that have separated themselves from God, including one by Jesus when he tells the story of the rich man and, and Lazarus. But what is assured is suffering and pain because you've removed yourself from God. You are separated from God. So, so an eternity separated from God is one of the choices that we all have. On the other hand, there is the eternity with God, which, as you would suspect, your pastor, uh, or those of you that are seeing us on the internet, uh, some guy speaking for Christ, on Christ's behalf is saying, choose this one choose this one. The scriptures say in, in places that we'll have bodies, there's a couple of different images there. What, we, what they'll look like is, is a little bit unknown, but what we do know is that death is an immediate transition point. I've said in this pulpit and others, when I've stood before a congregation of family and friends regarding someone who had, had passed on, that, that what we look at as human beings so frequently is death as an end, and sometimes an end in and of itself. But you see, for the Christian, death is a transition moment. It actually, in the way I would express it, is you, you're coming, you come to the doorway that we call death, and, and as your body is, is finishing its walk here on the earth, you, you literally, your spirit literally turns the handle on the door, and you walk from life to life. This is the Christian understanding of what happens when we die. And when we walk through this into an eternity with God, what we know is it is a consciousness that is safe and devoid of all evil, and it is immediate. When Gonzo read the scriptures from Luke, it says, it has Jesus saying, Jesus says, today, not at some later date or after you go through a long period of examination or even as we like to put in the comics as you stand in line at the pearly gates waiting to recount your life to the apostle Peter or some other uh, you know, cloudy imagery. It says, today you will be with me in paradise. That's immediate. That is immediate. So, and that's enough for me, by the way. 
So let me wrap it up with two questions that parallel the ones I just asked. Two, two questions we need to answer, we must answer. This is the one that you'll hear in your context, in your culture all the time, especially from those that are being de-churched, haven't been to church, or really just kind of have, want to grind against Christians. They will say this, why would a loving God send people to hell? You've heard it, yeah, adults? You've heard someone come to you, even someone you love, someone you know real well, and say, well, I can't believe in a loving God would send people to hell. Well, understand this, and this is scriptures. I can't talk about what the culture wants to do with it. I talk about scriptures. God sends no one to hell. Doesn't send anyone there. God has always protected the innocent. So we might say, well, why would God kill all those people far away that never, you know, send people to hell that never heard of him? He will not. God protects the innocents in culture far away. He protects the innocents that are aborted as babies. He protects the innocents that die before they come to know Jesus or have the opportunity. So take that one off the mat. It's really clear in scriptures that God always protects the innocents. And for those of us that live in the North American culture, which is where our DNA resides right now, this is what we can know. It's pretty hard to live here and not know about the church of Jesus Christ or the message of Christ. And so God does not send anyone that you know to hell. He allows them to choose it. This is a binary choice. He allows people to choose. He allows the informed to choose, not the innocent. He allows the informed to choose. So the Christian, while that might uh, be provocative, and we may want to spend all of our time there, the Christian asked an entirely different question, and this is where I'll take us home. Why would a person choose to not receive the gift of eternity with God? Why would a person choose to, choose to not receive the, the, a gift of eternity with God? Because peace awaits us there. The, the, the complete peace of spirit and soul. Everything in, in our eternity with God operates according to God's will. Conflict has been pitched in the bin. It doesn't exist, what, what, which produces peace in a loving community. Paradise is not an island in the Caribbean. I've been to some Caribbean islands. They're beautiful, they're wonderful, but they get hurricanes and typhoons. The peace that awaits us in glory is a complete peace of bind and soul. Why would a person choose not to receive the gift of eternity with God when joy awaits, when complete and utter joy awaits? We have a lot of earthly joy and we love it and we revel in it, but it also fades as time goes on. There is no limit to the joy in heaven. Sin and mourning and death will never be present and only unlimited joy would be at our fingertips and in our very living. Why would a person choose not to receive the gift of eternity with God? Because glory awaits. Not only will we know about God, but we will fully know the Lord as we are fully known. And all the truths of, question, of creation and every question we've ever asked, will be, the answers will be bestowed upon us. We will see the Lord. No imagination will be necessary. We don't have to look at Michelangelo's picture. We don't have to look at those depictions we've seen of this long flowing roads and a big bearded man. We don't have to imagine the Lord when we receive his glory. We will be present with him. And in Revelations it says this as clear as it can be said. And I heard a voice from the throne saying, behold, the dwelling place of God is with man and he will dwell with them and they will be with his people and God himself will be with them as their God. And we will never unsee or depart from the presence of God. The glory of God is so magnificent that once we see it, we cannot unsee it, nor will we ever depart for it. That sounds like paradise to me. Why would a person choose to not receive the gift of eternity with God because home awaits? I've always loved home. We're spiritual beings that have been granted earthly bodies. We walk around in these bag of bones, but this is not our permanent home. We know we have eternal spirits. We know that there's things within us that felt the same at five as they do at 55. This is just a temporary residence. I, I, I want to give you a little cultural thing. Jesus says in John 14, you can read it yourself later, and I hope you do. 
But he says, I go and prepare a place for you, a specific place. Now, culturally, if you don't understand this, and I've taught this before, so apologize in advance for that, but this is what that means. Culturally, when a groom would, would, would attain a bride, he would go back to his father's house, leave her with his father. This is why it was kind of unpredictable. It helps you understand weddings in the scripture being unpredictable because the groom had to first go back to his father's home and build a room on the side of it where he and his bride were going to live. Behold, I go and prepare a place for you. So that might take a month. It might take a year. I don't know. But then he would come back and take him to himself, which is what Christ says. Behold, I go before you. In my father's house are many mansions, are many rooms. I have prepared a place especially for you. Your home awaits you. Be ready. Because our preparation time to go to the place that's prepared for us is our earthly life. That's to say, right now. Hebrews records this, for this world is not our home. We are looking forward to our everlasting home in heaven. And that is what will happen to us. That's what happens to our spirit when we die. Listen, this is what I know for sure. There will come a day when this head stops having the ability to think. When this heart is not able to produce 60 beats a minute to keep me going. When these lungs will not keep doing their function of in and out and all the rest of the stuff that goes along with that. That day will come. I don't know when it is, but I do know this. When that moment comes, I am going home. And I've always loved home. And your home is ready too. And all you need to do is choose it and want it and live towards us. Let us pray. Oh God, we thank you for the permanence of our spiritual souls, of our lives. Empower us to live into your eternity right now through sharing in our lives. Let us, Lord, embrace the peace that passeth all understanding that you grant us. Let us embrace the joy that you give that, that blows up our hearts and, and, and never, ever ends. Let us, Lord, revel in the glory of your spirit, which we can encounter now and forever. And Lord, we thank you in advance for the place that awaits us. You have already prepared it in, our, in your kingdom. We already can live into it. And so all that we have the ability to say... It's for our life that is eternal. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. And amen.